Hello everyone, this is Alex Sigrist here for Pangyo Techno Valley TV. We're gonna begin the 2021 Pangyo monthly online meetup. This is now Pangyo Korea with Silicon Valley in the United States. Pangyo Techno Valley is one of the leading areas of innovation in Korea as well as Asia and attracting a lot of attention. Um, but we're very excited here to be bringing someone in who is a representative of Silicon Valley, which is kind of what we are striving for here uh, in Asia. We've had the chance to already have conversations with people from Zhongguangtun in China, as well as in France, uh, Station F. We've been able to talk about what's been going on in the world in Pangyo, but also in China and France. And we're definitely looking forward to seeing what uh, kind of issues have been the talk of the town out in California, in the United States, uh, being from the United States myself, very excited to make this happen. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and get started right now. And I would like to say hello to everyone who is joining us today uh, and our main two guests. First, I would like to give a special thank you and hello to Hubert Nguyen, the uh, editor in chief of Uber Gizmo in the United States. So thank you for joining us, Hubert. Hello, thanks for having me. It's great to have you too. Uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say uh, about not only kind of the area that you're in, because I myself have uh, not been able to go out to the Silicon Valley, especially in recent times, but uh, also the issues that are kind of big, because there's a lot of big news, especially in AI recently. So I'm really looking forward to talking to you about that. Uh, we also have uh, Mr. Moon Young Lim, the Gyeonggi-do Future Growth Policy Bureau Officer, uh, and some other officials from the GBSA are with us today. So, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> so, we have a lot going on, uh, and we would like to kind of begin this as we normally do, talk a little bit about Pangyo and Silicon Valley, but uh, because we do have uh, Mr. Moon Young Lim with us today, I thought maybe he could tell us a little bit about Pangyo, say hello, and give us a brief description of everything going on. So if uh, you don't mind telling us a little bit about Pangyo and uh, introducing yourself and what you do. Uh, hello, everyone. 안녕하세요. 반갑습니다. 경기도청 임문영 미래성장정책관입니다. 아, 판교의 이슈와 실리콘밸리의 이슈를 공유할 수 있는 자리를 갖게 되어서 아, 영광입니다. 아, 판교 테크노밸리에 대해서 간단히 소개하겠습니다. 판교 테크노밸리는 IT, BT, CT, NT 등 첨단 업종 중심의 R&D 클러스터로 2020년 기준 1,200개 입주 기업 중 첨단 기업이 약 93%를 차지하고 있습니다. 일 판교는 이제 조성이 완료되었고 이 판교 테크노밸리는 현재 조성 중입니다. 이 판교는 일 판교와 연계를 통한 4차 산업혁명 랜드마크로 아 판교는 스마트 금융 허브 및 맞춤형 주택 단지가 되도록 조성할 계획입니다. 경기도는 판교 테크노밸리를 글로벌 R&D 클러스터로서 역할을 할수 있도록 입주 기업들을 대상으로 커뮤니티 운영, 스타트업 보유, 거주지 임대 보증금 지원 등 다양한 지원 사업을 하고 있습니다. 앞으로 경기도는 이판교, 삼판교 구축을 통해 첨단 기업을 더 유치하고 다양한 지원 인프라를 구축해서 판교 테크노밸리가 4차 산업혁명 클러스터의 역할을 할수 있도록 노력할 것입니다. 감사합니다. Thank you so much. Uh, very quick translation of what we just uh, what he just introduced for us. Hi, my name is Moon Young Lim, the Gyeonggi-do Future Growth Policy Bureau Officer. Uh, it's an honor to be here and share some of the issues going on in uh, Pangyo and Silicon Valley. So he then introduced Pangyo Techno Valley as an R&D cluster centered on high-tech industries such as IT, BT, CT, and NT, and currently 93% of some 1,200 1, tenant companies are in the high-tech industries as of uh, this past year. So Pangyo 1 is where we are at right now. That's actually what's been completed. Pangyo 2, Techno Valley 2 and 3 are currently under construction. Um, and Pangyo 2 will be a landmark of the fourth industrial revolution by linking with Pangyo 1. And Pangyo 3 is going to be more of a smart financial hub and customized housing complex. 
So Gyeonggi-do is conducting various support projects for Pangyo Techno Valley, such as community operation, startup incubation, and housing rental deposit support for tenant companies so it can play the role as a global R&D cluster. And in the future, it will build the second and third, uh, we're gonna have the second and third Pangyo Techno Valley, uh, hopefully attracting more high-tech companies and building various infrastructure uh, projects that can properly serve the role of really making this place a fourth industry cluster that is meant to be. So again, thank you so much for sharing that information with us. So before we go, so before we go into kind of the issues, we do want to do a little Q and A at first. Uh, and I know that uh, we have some questions for Hubert as well. So, Mr. Moon Young Lim, if you can uh, go ahead and ask some of those questions for us right now, that would be great. 우버 기지모 휴버트 편집장님께 두 가지 좀 궁금한 것을 질문하고 싶습니다. 하나는 어, 실리콘밸리도 한국처럼 높은 집값 때문에 재직자들이 어, 집 구하기가 힘든 것으로 알고 있습니다. 실리콘밸리의 집값과 재직자 주거 현황이 어떤지 궁금하고요. 또 하나는 그 실리콘밸리 주변에 대학교가 많은데 어, 이런 점이 실리콘밸리 발전에 어떤 영향을 미치고 있는지 궁금합니다. Great, thank you. So Hubert, uh, two questions that he has. The first one is about the housing situation in the Silicon Valley and similar to Korea, uh, it's very expensive to find housing, uh, we presume. And so what is the, how, what are the housing prices like and the living conditions for people who are working in Silicon Valley? Uh, and then also the next question uh, was, there's a lot of universities, colleges around the Silicon Valley area. And so how has that affected the development of Silicon Valley? Um, so if you don't mind answering those two questions, that'd be great. Sure, yeah, so let me start with the, the housing situation. Um, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's uh, very expensive uh, around here and, um, and it has actually gotten worse than it used to be. Um, so the, the main issue is that we don't build uh, fast enough and there's no really any solution in sight. Um, so I expect this to continue at the moment. So there's two categories of employees, like for the tech workers, if you're like a, an engineer or something like that, then it's not so bad because you're paid enough to find lodging and, and, and so it's okay. But for uh, all the supporting staff and people who are not engineers, then it can get very expensive uh, very fast. And for students, you know, they can find like small rooms and stuff. Um, so let me go to the second question. Um, it's true that uh, Silicon Valley had uh, in the past been uh, kind of built by, you know, the, the presence of universities. Uh, we have three major universities here and that's part of the Silicon Valley history. And it would not have been what it is today without those universities. So today it's still a big source of talent and innovation. Uh, just to cite an example, Robin Hood, uh, just went IPO and it was developed in Stanford less than 10 years ago. Um, but now with all the big tech companies, we can also pay people enough to have them move uh, from anywhere. Okay, thank you. Um, thank now, you. We also have a question from your side, I believe, Hubert. So uh, do you have any questions for us over here? In the yeah, so I have a question for, for Mr. Moon. So I've been to Pangyo a couple of times. And um, I know that it is a leading place for technology in Korea, but I don't know the, the story behind what's the driving force uh, behind Pangyo and who's investing in it. 네, 음, 한국은 역사가 5천 년이 넘는 나라입니다. 아, 따라서 그 한국의 서울은 수백 년 동안 형성된 복잡한 시가지 때문에 어, 굉장히 그 어, 미로처럼 되어 있는. 도시죠. 반면 판교는 처음부터 계획적으로 교통과 도시 기반 시설을 만들었고 또 서울에서 가까운 신도시이기 때문에 첨단 기업들을 많이 유치할 수가 있었습니다. 이곳에는 현재 네이버, 카카오 같은 디지털 기업, 또 NC 소프트, 넥슨 등 세계 최고의 온라인 게임 회사들이 있는데 이들이 지금 2000년 초반에 한국의 정부화를 이끌었습니다. 또 SK 바이오사이언스와 한미약품 등 바이오 기업 등은 코로나19 속에서 이들 기업이 
백신 항원에 위탁 생산을 맡는 등 적극 대응하고 있어서 투자가 더욱 활발해지고 있습니다. Okay, thank you. Uh, so in response to your question, Korea and Seoul have had a long history and it's sort of been made uh, through kind of this, I don't want to say randomness, but certainly over 5,000 years of Korean history and hundreds of years of history in Seoul. Um, it wasn't necessarily planned in the way that Pangyo was planned. And so Pangyo was able to attract many of these high tech companies because it's a new city that was planned to be this sort of tech hub from the beginning. Uh, and so the transportation system, the infrastructure, everything was planned from the beginning and it being close to Seoul as well uh, has been, you know, those things have been sort of what has allowed Pangyo to grow as it has today. Uh, and now we have digital, the companies such as Naver and uh, Kakao, which are huge companies in Korea for search, originally just a search engine and messaging app that have grown into even much bigger companies. Um, gaming companies, NCSoft, Nexon, uh, world's top gaming companies have also been uh, entered the infrastructure here. And we also have bio companies such as SK Bioscience and Hami Pharmaceuticals that are working on the coronavirus crisis here. Uh, as well as the product, you know, working on the production of vaccine antigens um, and also making more and more investments to help us get over the situation. So uh, to kind of overall answer it, I think it's, it's mostly the fact that it was such a well-planned and organized uh, city from the beginning. And also the fact that they planned it right next to Seoul. It's really, uh, it's, a, it's a 20 minutes. It's like 20 minutes, yeah. Uh, it's so quick, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's uh, that's mostly what uh, he said. And uh, thank you so much for sharing that answer with us. Right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, so now, if it's okay with everyone, we're going to go ahead and move on to sort of the main topic of this interview uh, with talking about Pangyo, as well as learning a little bit about Silicon Valley, which is the point, an exchange of information, ideas, uh, as well as just learning about each other. Uh, I know that uh, Hubert has actually been here, uh, but you know I have a lot to learn about uh, Silicon Valley. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, if it's okay with you, Hubert, Hubert, do you mind if I go ahead and start by talking about Pango Techno Valley and the issues that are relevant here? Please, yes. Great. Okay, so let me quickly go ahead and set up uh, the PowerPoint presentation that I've got prepared for us. So. Give me just one moment here. Now, I've talked about this uh, for the previous two uh, interviews in this series, so I'm going to try to do it a little bit differently this time. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, absolutely. All right, fantastic. So we're going to talk about Pangeo Techno Valley and a little bit about not just what it is, but also my experiences here as well. So Pangeo Techno Valley is located by train about 20 minutes south of Seoul. So from Gangnam Station to here, it was such a, it, it was honestly, man, it was a, less than 20 minutes and then a short bus ride to where I'm at right now, uh, kind of the startup center as well. It's really near the technology and financial hubs of Seoul. And as that you know transition has been made, now the technology sector has kind of moved into Pangyo Techno Valley as we have so many different companies and uh, workers that have come down to this area. There are three Pangyo Techno Valley areas. We've mentioned before the second and third are uh, going to be, uh, they're in development right now, uh, but currently we're in Pangyo First Techno Valley, which is where it all started. So this is basically um, Kind of the, the central focus. We're, the idea of this is it's a one plus five digital city with Pangyo Techno Valley being in the middle. And then you have these different areas around Korea, uh, including in Ilsan, uh, Yangju, Guri, and Gwangmyung, Sihung area, plus the Pangyo Techno Valleys two and three. Uh, with Pangyo Techno Valley being the center, this is hopefully the way that we can progress into. Uh, the future of Korea's economy. And this is, so we are in the hub right now. Now this is the, just kind of like the stats on this one. If you are watching this 
video later and you want to see some more of the information, this is basically telling us a little bit about how this all started. Uh, it kind of came as an idea, or at least it, it was formed a little more in a concrete way around 2003 and four. And the basically the building of this whole area happened from 2005 to 2015. I say the basic building of it, but I, there's always still new buildings going up, construction, new facilities, uh, new research centers going up. But the overall main project was from 2005 to 2015. Um, this is the basic slide talking about the strength and strategy of what we have here. It's bringing together startups as well as kind of Korea's big companies as we mentioned before, uh, Kakao, Naver, the gaming companies, bringing together startups, with the established companies bringing together these the workers to kind of share knowledge uh, as well as improve the educational environment around here as we uh, really just build ourselves into what we hope and we think will be the next silicon valley in the world here in asia though uh, this is just another chart talking about kind of the sales and some of the amazing stats um, that have happened. Let me skip ahead to this one right here. Kind of shows the progress that we've made from the companies that are in Hangyo every year going up. Um, obviously with the coronavirus situation, situations have changed, but even then in general, um, especially with Korea's uh, emphasis on, on online commerce, you know, these companies have really been kind of uh, just even throughout the coronavirus situation have really been doing well as we look to companies such as, you know, in Korea's environment, Coupang uh, has been the uh, delivery app that delivers the, the, I guess the Amazon equivalent of, uh, of Korea. So these companies here have been doing extremely well, improving. One thing that we are working on is improving the, uh, the ratio. It's not just a male dominated industry as it, you know, it, it's traditionally been in men, most parts of the world, if not all parts of the world. Uh, we are also encouraging a bit more of a diverse environment uh, that includes not only female employees, but also an inclusion of a lot of international employees and startup companies as well. Some of the companies you may recognize here, the industry leaders we talked about, Kakao, Africa TV, uh, which is a streaming platform um, similar to, I guess you'd say maybe Twitch or YouTube as well. Uh, and large, large companies such as Samsung, SK, SK planets, um, and the gaming companies, of course, gaming is one that's been really interesting to see recently, uh, talking to representatives in the industry, learning a little bit about the, um, it, it's cause it's not just the traditional games anymore. I actually had an interview recently. I got to talk to, uh, it's like a VR drone racing gaming company that's working with some of these companies. Um, so this is kind of the environment that we're living in. It's this great combination of Korea's high tech, um, high power companies mixing with these startups that are really starting from nothing and becoming um, a few of which have become sort of these impressive players in the game. Uh, in various industries. Uh, we'll skip ahead through some of these, but these are some of the leaders in IT, biotech, and culture technology as well. Um, you may recognize some of these if you're into gaming yourselves, um, but these are sort of the industry leaders out here. Yeah, many, uh, many famous names. Yeah. Um, have a couple friends that work for some of these companies i went to grad school out here in korea and so you know these companies certainly have hired um really a lot of talent and i have a few friends that got to actually work through these companies or work with these companies whether they're um you know international liaisons or sales representatives or even just working on the tech side as well so it's really cool to see uh some of my own friends company names even here as well one thing that is good out here, which I can kind of, I, I don't need the chart to talk about this is, uh, they really do a good job of getting their startup companies overseas exposure. I think that's one of the things that's most difficult for a lot of Korean startup companies. You have Koreans who maybe are just 
really top of the game when it comes to um, biomedicine, when it comes to gaming technology, but they're not sure how to reach an international market. And so a lot of investment is put into these companies uh, just to get their names out to um, different areas. And, and of course, this is one of the ways we're hoping to do that by having these kind of meetings and conversations that can go online, you know, into the interwebs and people can find out more information about them later. But uh, they've done a really good job of getting companies who, you know, to be honest, at the start, if you're three or four employees and, and none of you have uh, an expertise in English, um, they provide translation services at some of these startup centers. They, they provide outreach programs. They provide free coverage or I guess paid for media coverage um, for these companies. So they do a good job of getting these startup companies some global exposure. And uh, one of the companies recently I got to interview was a company that makes organoids or these like uh, kind of, it's not stem cells, but they take stem cells and then turn them into specific cells that can one day be transplanted into an organ in your body. And that's what the organoids would be. And their next step currently right now is moving to Japan, Europe, and the United States, trying to bring that technology to uh, medical centers around the world. Uh, but without Pangyo Techno Valley, it would have been an impossibility to make that happen. So I think they do a really good job of that out here. And that's some reason I'm really excited to kind of learn more about companies every time I get to interview one of them. Uh, these are some of the startup campuses out here. Uh, they have different accelerator programs and uh, some of them are specifically for Koreans, but a couple of them are actually for uh, foreigners that come to Korea and want to bring their companies into the Korean market, or at least use Korea as a base uh, to reach the entire Asian market as well. And we've been able to see a lot of success from that one. Anything from, again, medical technology companies to education platforms as well. So I think they've done a great job with that. And it's just something that's been really interesting to see. Pangyo Second Techno Valley uh, is what's coming next. And that's going to be what really brings us into the uh, fourth, you know, industrial revolution. I guess we're in it now, but really accelerates Korea to that kind of next level that we're looking to get into. Uh, and so when you add all this together, this is basically putting it all together. Why Pango second techno Valley is a very crucial part of the long-term plan of the sustainability of this area. Um, these are kind of just the expectations here, what we're looking to get. Um, one of the tough parts we talked about, of course, is the, the, it's just expensive, right? We talked about housing a little bit ago of how expensive it is to be in Korea or, or specifically Seoul. Pongo Techno Valley too is not a cheap place to live. So what they're trying to do with the second and I believe third Techno Valleys as well is to make it as expensive as it is gonna be, make it a much more livable place for not only families, but also people coming here temporarily long-term. Uh, so that includes building up the urban infrastructure when it comes to uh, places, oops, just lost, there we go. Uh, for families, for uh, people here as exchange students, as temporary workers, um, really working on that. Now, on one hand, the other thing I should say is on one hand, it is expensive to live here, but one of the things that's been nice about Pango Techno Valley, at least first Techno Valley so far, has been the low rent prices. That's been one of the things when I've talked to these companies that are starting up here, it's been saving them because, you know, obviously finding a place to work um, is, albeit a little bit different during COVID times, finding a place to work that isn't overpriced like it can be in Seoul. Uh, has been really restrictive on them, and they've been able to now save a lot of money in the initial stages, get out of the, get out of the red faster, uh, and so that's one way that Pangyo has done a great job of helping out. Yeah, but I was going to ask, like, what what's the incentive, or what are the incentives, and and that's clearly one of them. Oh, absolutely. Um, we can even talk about that because again, these are these are just slides that are giving, you know, it's it's the basic information about it. But since I'm at the end right now. Um, the incentives for coming here are uh, based on all the interviews I've done. And even actually, I've checked out some of these startup accelerator programs. I never ended up applying for them, but 
some of the incentives are one, uh, the city itself is really cool. Like it's a planned city. So uh, I know coming up next, they're, they're trying to work on like getting a, uh, oh, my English is k- killing me. What is it? What is it in San Francisco? Like the trolley system or oh, the tramway, that kind of- like, a, like something like that is coming up mm-hmm. with like autonomous vehicles. Um, mm-hmm. I just went to a cafe recently that it wasn't like, it was like a takeout cafe that had the, uh, well, those autonomous robots, um, that just make it for you. Right. You can order it. Oh yeah. I think I've seen that. It's, it seems really cool. They're they're really fun. Um, so it's, it's neat. It's a cool place to be. Uh, but also for the companies that are starting up here, a lot of programs offer free office space. And not only even the building we're in now, it's not just free office space. There's research facilities in the building that they can use. Um, networking is big. I know that there's a, in this building as well, there is a research facility that is run by, uh, well, run by the center, but it brings together the Korean army as well as startups that are working in military technology. So you have a research center that is secured because a lot of the information is sensitive uh, when it comes to military, especially in Korea. Um, But you have these different connections that are being set up so that these companies that are working on AI technology or drone technology, um, you know, they're able to access data from Korean, the Korean military uh, and work together to improve I guess, not only military weaponry, but any technology that's related to that. And of course, the other incentives is you're, you know, a lot of people come here for the money. Uh, One, you get money from accelerators and um, at least the opportunity to present yourself. Um, But also you're next to these big companies like Kakao, like Nexon. um, And you can, You know, a lot of companies do have the goal of being either bought out or at least working together and, um, you know, using their technology uh, to be a, I guess, a contract company or work on the side with these companies to make money um, on different projects. You know, especially like nowadays, blockchain is a big one, especially Mm -hmm. with Dow and Naver. Uh, So you have a lot of tech startups that are in blockchain technology and and then they end up working or... um, either being bought out or working with um, these huge companies. So that's another one when it comes to money. There was another one related to, I just, it just slipped my mind. Um, But of course, like other things that they, that I often hear is like people come here looking for jobs. Like it's, these are, Korea's got like the highest rate of like PhDs in the OECD in the world, maybe something like that. And these people who have these masters and PhDs and in tech, they come here looking for jobs. So it's actually pretty easy for these startup companies to find people um, because it, it's just kind of known that this it's, is- a ver- it's a very invaluable position uh, because the rest of the world has a very hard time to find uh, engineers and like, yeah. highly educated uh, people. It's, it's actually, <laughs> it's, it's an oversupply of workers here, which is unfortunate for the workers. But uh, you know, if you do well, you can still, you know, but you can't command salary that you might be able to command in other places in the world. Um, but yeah, the, the amount of workers here is incredible. Plus the other thing is, um, I'm sure it's probably the same as Silicon Valley, but I've also heard it's very easy to attract money if you're either working for an accel- work, working under an accelerator or you're working in Pangyo because there's sort of a name recognition. It's like if you go to the Ivy Leagues, you know, you might get a job because you have whatever Harvard on your degree. In the same way, if you have Pangyo Techno Valley as your as your home base, uh, it is kind of a you know, what's the right? What do people use? Clout is that the right word? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you can use clout, I and mean, there's um, it means like you've been vetted, right? Yeah. So uh, you you have more trust uh, all of a sudden, and and people are willing to listen to you. And it's a really good idea to have all these people in the same location. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that's it. I mean, that's kind of the basics. Just being around the area is really cool. The only downside so far, uh, which I haven't been able to experience as much, is because of the coronavirus situation, you know, you don't get – everyone here is high tech, right? I mean, everyone here, it's, it's a tech field, or at least I haven't been I know able – the feeling. <laughs> you can't network as well. 
unfortunately, like I've been able to do certain business dinners before the re recent restrictions and meet people. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's just weird. I would like to go to a networking event and have a drink and meet all these people because that's one of the advantages that you do have being here. But there is some restrictions now, like you meet people generally in your building or your accelerated community. Um, there's no like free, I don't know what you call it. Like, there's always that story in Silicon Valley of like, I don't know how true it is, but you know, like people from different companies working, you know, talking, sharing ideas. And then like, they come up with a new idea and you create a new company at a bar over a drink. <laughs> it's it's actually kind of true, um, but also because you know it's it's um, we have seven million people in the Bay Area, wow. but the, like the tech circle is not actually that big. So depending on your industry, mm -hmm. uh, you know you like for example, I used to work in uh, computer graphics. Everybody knows everyone, and uh, so you know you have friends of friends, and maybe you went to uh, your friend's place, and then you meet like this other person. And mm -hmm. then you start chatting and, and so on. But it's true that many companies have been created like on a, in a cafe, <laughs> you know, writing on a napkin. That's uh, true. Wow. Um, so, yeah, hopefully um, we think that in November, once over 70% of the population is vaccinated, we'll be back to a certain level of normal here. And uh, I'll be looking forward to that time in Korea. Uh, but until then... That, that is the situation here in Pangyo. Do you have, before we get into some of the issues, I'll have to do that quickly. Do you have any questions about the air? I know you've been here though. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, yeah, I've, be, I've been there, but I, I don't know the area enough that I have a, a ton of questions. But first, the overview is great. Uh, I've learned a lot of things. Um, and it seems like the Pangyo has grown by like 40% since uh, I visited it in uh, 2018 last. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty impressive. Uh, and I was not aware that more of it, I mean, it looks like I've seen only a quarter of the project. And, and I, I was not aware that uh, so much more was, was planned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely exciting to see all the changes going on right now and uh, look forward to the next time you get to come by and check it out. Yeah, I hope, I hope we can soon. Yeah. Uh, so quickly, um, before we go on here, I'm going to go ahead and talk about some of the issues that are going on right now. Um, I'm not, I think I, looking at kind of our outline of our plan, what we were going to talk about, I, I feel like I maybe switched the order. Maybe I, I was supposed to let you go first, but if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and uh, oh, yeah. the presentation go ahead. Yeah. and uh, just talk a little bit about what's going on. And if you have anything, any questions about uh, specific topics or ones that you think might be related to your areas of expertise or just, any curiosities, just let me know in the middle, interrupt me, it's no problem at all. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do a little bit of movement around here. Okay. So uh, one of the things that I am kind of tangentially a part of, not because of my, my history or my background um, has been I guess, uh, blockchain technology and NFTs. And because my friends are all involved in it and I just kind of try to steal information from them all the time and see what I can find out from them without being a part of the community. Uh, but big, the big news has been certainly cryptocurrencies, but in the tech circles out here, I think bigger news has certainly been NFTs as well as general blockchain technology. Um, and uh, so this particular story is, is a little bit about NFTs. Ground X talks to Clip Drops artists at Kakao MM. So there's an event uh, that was held on the 17th with Ground X CEO Ha Deson and uh, seven artists who appeared as speakers. And Clip Drops itself is these are the artists under Clip Drops or using the Clip Drop service. It's a service that curates and distributes to digital artworks in the digital asset wallet Clip, K L I P. Um, the works published will be recorded on Ground X's, they were recorded on Ground X's own development, <clears throat> excuse me, public blockchain Clayton. So Clayton is, uh, you know, down the line under Cacao 
as well. And they even have their own coin. Um, but basically, this is kind of the what we're seeing now is the realization of artists being paid for their work, but um, especially now in the digital age, linking that to blockchain technology. Um, if anyone out there is just, has no background in this and doesn't know anything about NFTs, um, basically it is a way of kind of owning online property. I'm gonna go, it's owning something and that your ownership license basically is on maybe a blockchain or something like that. Uh, it's much more complex than I'm able to talk about. Um, but anyway, this is just one of the things that has been uh, certainly been talked about recently. Uh, so it's been really cool to see some of the expansion of blockchain technology into more than just a coin that you can invest in, uh, but being able to see real tangible results. Um, and as an artist myself, you know, being able to see artists being paid, finding new avenues for uh, revenue streams. So this has been kind of one of the big stories that came out in the past month. Yeah, I think I think you explained it well. I mean, at the core of NFT, the the the, the protection, like the protection of the ownership, is mm -hmm. the main thing. And uh, what I find interesting as well is that every time someone resells, so let's say I buy like some NFTs, and then if I resell it, then the author gets some money from it again. So at every transaction. And and that's definitely new, um, and yeah, I, there's a little bit of a bubble right now. But I think like fundamentally, the technology is super interesting, and uh, it, it's going to be really useful once we kind of figure things out. Absolutely, I I am in agreement with you right there. It, it is a bubble, but I I do see the long term use value of mm -hmm. all. Of it. It's going to be really cool to see how that uh, develops for sure. Yeah, right now I'm trying to sell all my JPEGs. <laughs> <laughs> Going to sell pictures from my Facebook from 15 years yep. ago if anyone wants to buy them. Yep. Uh, next up, um, this is just kind of an update on OnLob is like, uh, it's, it's, the, it's a firewall virus protection company that uh, uh, used to offer like a free firewall service for Koreans. I guess still does. Um, but there was just news that the next generation firewall trust guard uh, 20,000B uh, had these en enhancements and performance enhancements that was actually going to be more helpful for people who are now working a, uh, outside of their company. You know, it's easier to protect company information, company software when you're working at the same office. Um, but I believe it's just kind of an update in the hardware performance of existing high end. Um, the trust guard 10,000 B. Uh, the difference now is compared to the previous model, the firewall traffic processing performance has increased by 20% and the maximum number of process processing sessions increased by one and a half times. Uh, so just in a quick update on. Yeah. So, you know, actually with the pandemic, the, uh, the security stuff has been a big, big issue for a lot of companies. Absolutely. Because now, like uh, some some large tech companies have sent everyone home, and you know when you're at home, it's not as secure as when you're in the office. Um, so there's a lot of um, security updates that have been going on, and uh, I, I can't see why they would you know uh, do this new product. Mm. Uh, so great. Uh, next, I'm I'm taking a little bit of your time. I should I'm supposed to be done in the next minute or so. Uh, right. Another big investment was a. Uh, Naver investing in TBCA Soft, and uh, I think it was a big deal. Not just because it's a U.S. blockchain developer, developer, which is again um, huge news for the, at least again tangentially speaking. I am someone who's trying to be involved uh, in the community, but it's just great news for the blockchain community out here as well. Um, but this is also big news because uh, I believe it's uh, SoftBank that has the the highest share, they, the most investments in TBCA soft. And I don't know, Naver Financial has announced that they are uh, making investments in them worth up to 20 million US dollars. Uh, and, and this is important too, because Naver, one of the things is they, they're trying to expand their global payment system of Naver Pay, which is something we use over here. You know, you link up your credit card or bank account and you can buy stuff, it's generic, you know, simple Amazon stuff. But Naver, I know, is also working on their own coin, uh, 
underneath them, they have line and then the coin, I believe is the link. Uh, but they are trying to use blockchain technology to expand their global payment system. So that's something that uh, is definitely, I guess, for me, more than just like the news of them doing this, I think the big news is sort of the cementing of, as someone who was a skeptic maybe five or 10 years ago when he shouldn't have been, uh, I, I now kind of, it's interesting seeing more and more the actual impl implementation of blockchain technology uh, in companies that previously kind of shunned it, to be honest. I don't know about Naver specifically, but big companies had previously shunned it and now to see it a part of the community as you know, here to stay is kind of an interesting and cool aspect of it. Yeah, it's pretty funny to see, like to go back like five years and see what uh, big financial institutions were saying about Bitcoin then oh, and now. <laughs> it's just, it's, I, I guess I listened, I listened uh, before big institutions did, or at least before big institutions admitted that they were interested in it. But, uh, you know, I, I guess, Korea was early as well, talking about blockchain technology as far as like the community itself. I'd be curious to see what Silicon Valley was like five years ago, though. And well, you know, ten years ago, the um, Elian, the co-founder of Ubergismo, told me, "Hey, have you looked at the the Bitcoin thing?" And then, you know, I I kind of looked quickly and I said, "Ah, that's garbage." <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I, yeah. I'll admit I wasn't on on that boat. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Oh, so yeah, again, uh, just going to keep running through this quickly. Uh, this was kind of a big deal because Korea had a trouble accessing kind of the vaccine scene, if you will, um, early on as we had very low cases in the beginning. And then so we waited to get vaccines and then all of a sudden cases spiked in Korea and we realized we couldn't get it, our hands on vaccines. So we we're actually behind the U.S. when it comes to uh, getting vaccines out to its citizens. But Big news was that SK Bio vaccine got the first phase three approval. Uh, and so we're a little bit closer with GBP510. Uh, this is the current name of the vaccine. Um, we're a little bit closer to being self-sufficient, being able to provide our own citizens with vaccines, as well as eventually helping with COVAX and getting vaccines out to other countries that need the vaccines as well. This is a big deal for me because I've been waiting for it and I finally got my first vaccine shot last week um you and, can travel. yeah i can start to move ish but uh it's it'll be nice especially because now we're finding out that we're all going to probably need the uh the booster shots so yeah it's good to have our own supply here so very excited to see that news coming out and i know in the u.s you've had some people have had access since you know early january my brother worked at a mm -hmm. my brother at the time was working at a nursing care facility and uh, he got it right away, appropriately. Uh, yep. But my whole family had it by May, maybe April. Like my dad was the first one to find out that they were like kind of basically dishing it out at like local Kroger's or I don't know, whatever supermarket. Oh yeah, had. here you could even choose like which one you want and all that, uh, it was great. <laughs> um, so that's good news. Uh, of course, not just for Korea, but anyone else who's gonna be affected by that. Um, very quickly, it's just kind of a fun news, I guess, is that Kim Bom Su, who was is the founder of Kakao, CEO of Kakao, became the richest man in Korea. This, how I'm not I, surprised I use Kakao every day. Oh, how I didn't see this as the best investment opportunity, I have no idea. Um, because we use it, and then all of a sudden, the, the story of they were just, it's just a messenger. And then like, okay, you can buy stuff on this messenger. You can buy these emoticons, cool, whatever. Oh, okay, they've got like a TV content. Oh, okay, they've got a bank. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this company, to see the rise of Kakao was certainly just, it was just fascinating to see how quickly they went from, we're a messaging app to, we have, I can't believe Facebook doesn't have a bank yet. They're way behind. I don't get it. I know they're working on. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. They tried to do crypto and then they got shut down. Yeah. Um, but you know what? Their their emojis are not nearly as good. <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, so that was just kind of a quick, fun little bit of news. Um, to, I, I'm running low on time. Quickly, NCSoft published the first ESG report in the gaming industry. Um, this was a big deal. One of the biggest companies in the world when it comes to gaming to have an environmental, social, and government manage governance management. Um, playbook, if you will, for this uh, has been 
you know, you have to have the leaders of the industry start it, get the ball rolling. Uh, so that was a big deal for us as well. Um, but also, oh, I, I, I could go out of turn here, skip ahead and come back. Um, the next one founder, Kim Jong-ju, has resigned as a CEO, uh, taken a step back as well. Um, give me a second here. I'm skipping ahead and now I'm realizing I, I got to look around, jump around my notes as well. Uh, but that being said, they've appointed E. Jaekyo as the head of its brand promotion division as the new CEO. Um, from my understanding, he's stepping down, but still playing an active role in the company as with, you know, as what happens most times when CEOs uh, do step down and, but they still remain a big part of it. Uh, Link versus Clayton. Uh, Link, these are the cryptocurrencies, uh, basically line, line or neighbor versus cacao. Uh, and so Line has finally entered in Korea, uh, which, you know, it sounds kind of strange that neighbor would take this long to get into Korea, but, you know, Line is sort of like often has a lot of their business in Japan. Um, but that being said, uh, they've entered the market under BitThumb, one of the cryptocurrency exchanges out here. Uh, Clayton has been on the exchanges for quite a while now, I've, at least based on my personal knowledge of it. Um, but this will be interesting. I, I'm really curious to see how, like, you know, obviously like when you talk about big blockchain technology, when it comes to Bitcoin versus Ethereum versus Cardano, which is the new big player in the game, um, you know, those are all interesting stories, but I think on the, the company level, companies that are really investing in their own coin technology, that's where I kind of want to see where this goes. Cause that was sort of a fear in the cryptocurrency community a while back, like, well, we don't need Bitcoin if Facebook makes their own coin and this company makes their own coin. I'm just kind of curious to see how it plays out. I don't have a lot of predictive capabilities in my own head right now, uh, but to see what happens with Link and Clayton, that'll be really interesting, I think. Yeah, yeah to me, like um, all these coins have different characteristics. So even like BTC versus uh, ETH, is uh, mm -hmm. that's a very different play. I mean, ETH is more like of a commodity like oil and and uh, BTC is more like gold. Um, and then, you know, for Facebook, you're basically like within the Facebook uh, ecosystem, probably, if they get to do it someday. They do it one day. Mm -hmm. okay. I've talked my mouth. I've talked way too much. Thank you for uh, listening. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, thank you for joining in. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, with, oops, I'm, I'm kind of previewing yours accidentally here. Let me get off screen sharing. That being oh, said, yeah, I, I can share my screen if you want. Why don't you just yeah get started right away? I mm -hmm. will stop screen share. I think I gotta get back into this. Um, give me just a second. There we go. Okay, welcome back. Yeah. Take it. <laughs> no, no okay. more. Let's go. All right. So I um so for tonight I've I've selected a few topics around uh, AI and space that that we can use to discuss. And uh, so I'll just present Uber Gizmo uh, very briefly. Uh, so Uber Gizmo is one of the top consumer electronics uh, news websites in the US. Uh, we were founded here in San Francisco, and we also publish in uh, English, uh, obviously English, uh, Japanese, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Um, so we do uh, news and reviews, and, and we like to cover all kinds of things, um, uh, tech that are interesting to us, including startups. Uh, we've been nominated to the Web Year Awards uh, a while back, and we've been mentioned in like Wall Street Journal, CNN, Nikkei. Um, so you know, we've been around for a while. And uh, so tonight, uh, tonight for me, <laughs> uh, I wanted to talk about AI uh, in the context of a few things like you know manufacturing, agriculture, and all that. Um, it's like maybe some some use cases that people are not so familiar with. And then I wanted to talk about space um, because it's been boring for a while, but now things are getting very, very interesting uh, for, for different reasons. So just um, to start with AI and manufacturing, uh, the, the problem with uh, industrial robots is that, you know, those arms in, in the manufacturing plants, they need a lot of training, they need a, a lot of uh, programming. And everything needs to be like super controlled, right? So if you move something like by like an inch, then the robot cannot work anymore. 
uh, and and um, that's really a big problem uh, in general. So it, it makes the, everything more expensive. And so the possible solution that some people here in Silicon Valley are looking at is a more generalized a, uh, AI that would be you know a, a little smarter and that could adapt to a situation. So for example, if you're at your desk and I move your keyboard a little bit and your mouse, you're not going to be all confused. Uh, and that's kind of where we want to go with uh, robots. And if we could do that, it would make everything a lot cheaper because the robots don't need to be so accurate anymore and you don't need to always constantly like control the environment. Um, so that would that would turn like a very specialized robot into like a more generalist one. And if you think about it, a lot of people in, in manufacturing plants today are just kind of taking a box, opening it, uh, moving the parts into like a bin or something like that. And, and conceptually, a lot of uh, robots could do it, except today they cannot. And they cannot because they're not as smart as we think they are. Uh, so for example, uh, in, in computer vision, uh, we've made a lot of progress since uh, 2015, where when deep learning kind of came on, onto the scene. But uh, so this is an example of, a, of an image of a dog. And using the same AI, if you just change a few pixels, now all of a sudden it thinks it's an ostrich. And uh, so uh, some researchers, you know, kind of like to, to fool the AIs like that. But if you show that to a human, even like a child, they will see it's the same dog. And so that's why AI is really good today, but it's like not nearly good enough. And so the goal is to have like human type intelligence. Um, and I think there's a lot of pressure or there's a lot of um, uh, investment in this type of AI because we have a labor shortage. And after like a year of supply chain issues, uh, a lot of people are wondering, hey, you know, why don't we bring some manufacturing back? And, and sometimes, you know, even electricity is cheaper in some parts of the US. Uh, so I know, I know of some Chinese companies that moved to the US because energy was cheaper. And there's a very interesting company that I, that I looked at. Uh, it's called uh, Vicarious. And they have that new tech called uh, recursive cortex networks. And it's kind of like a new form of AI that they claim can do all the stuff that I talked about. Hmm. And so I would recommend uh, people to, to check them out if you haven't heard of them. Great, thank you. Uh, quick question. Yeah. Um, I, I know the big news was, the big news as far as like local, uh, I don't know, lay people like me, we all heard about the Elon Musk reveal of the AI robot was, was that significant or was that more for show? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, to me, it was like a total show. Um, I mean, <laughs> what he's talking about, maybe like someday it, it would happen. But at the moment, um, you know, like in the news, if, if you follow the US news, like a Tesla just kind of slammed into like a, an emergency vehicle. So yeah, it's kind of far off, and and um, the launch was like a guy dancing in a costume. I don't know. I, I'm not convinced. <laughs> Let's put it this way. <laughs> okay. Maybe something good will come out of it. <laughs> I mean, he did say some crazy stuff, and now we're in space, in the billionaire space. Yeah, race. of course. Yeah, yeah. So I can't. I mean, I can't dismiss that. You know, he he might get it done someday. But for now, like back back in the days with Tesla, there was like a roadmap that was believable. Uh, I'd like to see something like that. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, so agriculture is like something that I think might be uh, greatly improved with AI. Because a lot of um, a lot of agriculture actually requires like uh, people doing stuff like uh, harvesting or like weeding out plants. And uh, again, we, we have like a big um, a shortage of labor right now. And so I found uh, so that's that particular company is not based in, in Silicon Valley, but I thought it was a very good example. So it's like a, um, a, an AI machine that goes around and recognizes weeds and they kind of zap it with a laser. Um, and, and the goal is not to use any chemicals, right? Because chemicals are really bad for the soil and, and for people probably as well. So if you can avoid it, that's, that's awesome. 
And uh, so in California, there's a big interest in that type of technology because uh, we, it's a very sunny state and uh, AI can also help with like using less water. Um, so there's a very good incentive to develop this technology. Um, and apparently you could produce more uh, vegetables as well. So, um, you know, uh, it, it can totally replace humans for some type of harvesting. And so that, that becomes very interesting. So two companies that I found uh, in the Silicon Valley, one is uh, Abundant Robotics and uh, FF Robotics. Uh, so uh, you can check them out. They are both kind of harvest oriented um, and not in the, in the zapping weeds, but they, they address a very interesting problem. And so next, the, um, the, the self-driving uh, aspect. So we've, people have talked about it for a while. And then right now, we are kind of stuck at, um, at, at a certain level. But I mean, it's very hard to not see the benefits of having truly self-driving cars. Um, it's just like better in general. Um, so everybody wants that. And that's why all the uh, automakers have some type of presence in Silicon Valley. Uh, because software is uh, very important for that. And then you have the sensing uh, kind of uh, technology as well, but software is the key. Uh, so if you're not familiar with uh, the various level, so today we're at level three in terms of self-driving. And that means like you need to have your, you're not doing the driving, but you need to have your hands on the wheel. You need to pay attention uh, because the car can make a mistake at any time. Um, but the goal is to get to level five, and that's like the car does everything. You don't need to worry about it, and you can you know do your work uh, in your car. And level four is something in between. So uh, this is a topic of research, and uh, the, the one of the issues is you need to train the cars. You need to drive a lot, um, and that's really time consuming, and it's super expensive. So there's a couple of companies that I like. Uh, so uh, NVIDIA uh, has been developing a, like a drive simulator. So if you look at the photo with the car, it's actually a 3D image. It's not like a, it's not like a video or photo. So it's a virtual world that's kind of realistic enough so that you can train uh, uh, self-driving cars. And the cool thing when you train them in the virtual world is you can drive much faster than real time. So in one hour, you can drive like a thousand or 100 hours and, mm -hmm. and you can scale, right? So you can have like 10 data centers doing like thousands or millions of driving sessions uh, without having a single driver. That's smart. Yeah, so, and then you also, you can create all kinds of like weird scenarios that you, you don't see in the real world. So you can, you can uh, for example, use like, real accidents and then kind of reproduce them to teach the car to avoid that next time. Mm. So it's, it's super interesting. Um, and then the second company is a uh, perceptive automata. And so what they do is they have developed an AI that's smart enough to know what people are doing, like really what people are doing. Because today, like the car kind of sees, oh yeah, there's a person but they have no idea if you're paying attention, mm -hmm. uh, if you're working, if you have something in your hand and all that. Uh, so this company kind of analyzes that and it can help the car kind of um, predict if you're going to like run in front of it or uh, because you're not paying attention, uh, for example. And, and that's kind of like a big plus for safety if you can do that. No kidding, right? Especially with mm -hmm. like the idea of having kids running around the streets, that's, that's be, that's beyond my grasp. Like I could never. I'd have to go back yeah. to ten years. How that makes sense? Uh, but that's amazing. Yeah. So it's like a very specialized type of AI that's kind of focusing on on like people's behavior. Uh, so super interesting stuff. Uh, I I recommend people to check it out. And so like the whole self driving thing, it's like we are the um, and you know it uses like edge computing. So like the the, the computers that are in cars or mobile phones are now so powerful, so fast. And then the networks are so, are so reliable that now you can do all these things. And uh, it's the convergence of the, 
the many decades of technology, at least the past two decades of technology, uh, in the form of like uh, you know like uh, chips and clouds and networks. So you know like those are very like two thousand ish kind of technologies uh, that is supporting the new tech, uh, which is AI and mobile. And you really need the two of them uh, to have all this technology function. So it's like old Silicon Valley is helping like new Silicon Valley. That's how I look at it. Got it. Yeah. So yeah, also on the AI front, there's a lot of things going on, but but these I think I have my interest in and I wanted to share that. No, that's fantastic. Thank you. That's it's really cool to see what's going on, especially with the uh, self-driving cars and actually to me, agriculture as well, knowing that we've had such an outflow of migrant workers who we just don't have people picking our plants anymore. Like, so mm -hmm. I know a huge deal in like the South East area, kind of like maybe in Georgia and, and finding enough adequate workers so that plants just, or like fruits don't go bad on the trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, if, if you put the, like the, if you raise the minimum wage and it's more pressure, like financial pressure on the farms, uh, it becomes very complicated. Uh, so I think there's like a huge demand for, uh, an alternative. Now, if you don't mind, um, we're, we are sort of past the one hour mark, but I know mm -hmm. you're interested in space and I am as well. So we can go a little bit over if you don't mind, if you could. Okay, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll let you keep an eye on, on the time, but um, yeah, let's, uh, let's take a quick look. Uh, I, I have time on my side. Cool, great, thank you. Yeah, so, all right, so space now is exciting. Um, and because there's a a few new businesses that are kind of forming, and I think that's going to create big changes and possibly societal changes. All right. So at the at the core of all this, uh, it's mostly SpaceX that I'm going to talk about because they are operational now versus Blue Origin. Uh, but basically, like the the reusable launch systems are making everything more uh, affordable, so you can you have more options to build uh, new services. And uh, so one thing that I like a lot is uh, Starlink. Um, so if, for, for people who don't know what it is, it's uh, a constellation of satellites all around the, the planet and uh, that provide uh, fast internet access. And so I've read some reviews and all that. And, you know, it's uh, not perfect, but it's working quite well, uh, especially for people who have no other options. And so basically, I mean like 100 megabits a second in the really? middle of nowhere. This is this is what they talked about before, right? When it was like kind of villages that had no access to internet before now, they're able to, in theory, they'll, they'll be able to actually access the internet. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah, and, and you know, like the, the, the other option before was like, um, it, you could have a satellite link, but it was super slow and it was extremely expensive. And this is as, for, as affordable as like a home, like a normal fast home internet. And, but you can get it in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So it's uh, so I think there's a chance that that Starlink might become the largest internet provider in the world. Wow. And uh, so that and and you know like the Facebook and and Google tried to kind of uh, increase the the internet access um, worldwide. I don't think it went anywhere, uh, but that could actually help them a lot because it can connect uh, quite a few more people. Sure, yeah, absolutely. And then, so the second thing that I am interested in is uh, the Starship. So, you know, that's like uh, the ship that's supposed to go to Mars. But I think the application here on Earth is much more interesting to me because you can travel from any point of the globe in like half an hour. Wow. That right. is so, you, <laughs> so <laughs> FedEx <laughs> uh, would pay for that kind of, uh, of uh, service, I think. That's amazing. Um, speaking of spaceships, okay, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Mm -hmm. Of all the billionaire spacecrafts or NASA, which spaceship would you go on? Which one would you trust the most? Uh, are SpaceX, are going with Blue Origin? Are we going with net, just traditional NASA? I think the Blue Origin one doesn't look good enough. <laughs> and the design is just like, I mean, there's like physics reasons why it's like that, but uh, today I would go with SpaceX because they have a pretty good track record, uh, Virgin better is well. than NASA for humans. Yeah. 
yeah so yeah i'd go with the uh, spacex and uh, the dragon uh capsule <laughs> and uh yeah that you know if you want to go like in outer space um what you need is like this so you know like in the space station today there's like billions of dollars of like uh spare parts and and stuff like that and it's there just in case right because they might need them uh because if something breaks you can't you can't really like order and get it like uh, within next day takes at least 30 minutes on that spaceship <laughs> yeah and uh and and so uh, the the solution to that is to print the parts only when you need them and there's a company that does that it's called made in space um and i think they already have a contract uh, to be on the space station and, and so the idea is you design the parts to be printed to start with and you you bring the those 3d printers with you and uh, so these are not like normal 3D printers because they need to be working without any gravity. Wow. And, and a lot of 3D printers, you know, rely on gravity to like pull the material down. Um, so yeah, so so that's that would be amazing because it would again make things a lot cheaper. And then when it's cheaper, more people can do it. And then when more people do it, we we get more innovation. And uh, so, yeah, so that was the last company that I want to talk about. I mean, we have a ton of topics, um, but uh, yeah, those were of interest for, for this time. Great, no, thank you so much for sharing that. It's really interesting to see what's going on, especially in the AI technology fields. And of course, me as a, as a forever child, man, talking about space, we could have done the whole hour on that, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> we might. <laughs> let's do it let's do it next time <laughs> or another time yeah absolutely um so that's great thank you so much for talking about that hubert mm -hmm. um it was really great to kind of learn about what, what's going on right now especially in the u.s when it comes to these different areas um unfortunately because of work uh mr moon young lim had to go uh so it's just you and i as part of our saying goodbyes right now but that's it for today that was okay. the in uh, Silicon Valley, the US, Pangeo, Korea, um, you know, two places that are really exciting when it comes to technology, jumping into the next industrial revolution. Um, like to thank the editor in chief, Hubert Nguyen of Uber Gizmo. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for catching up with Pangeo. Uh, it's been a while. I I'd love to return. Oh, absolutely. You're welcome. As soon as we can uh, get the quarantine lifted in fact <laughs> you can whenever you can all right uh, much okay uh and thank you everyone who joined us we'll uh kind of close it up right now this was uh our third part in a series talking to people from all over the globe and uh, very excited to end it in the united states my home country as well my name is alex sigrist here in pangyo techno valley uh for pangyo techno valley tv and Thank you all. Hope you all learned something and we'll see you later. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.